Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology, and I'm also with the De uh, Carleton University Department of Geography and Environmental Studies. In this uh, video, I'm going to continue my discussion on global dimming. So what we're really talking about is we're talking about aerosols, the effect of aerosols in the atmosphere, aerosols from unburned fossil fuels, from uh, uh, industrial civilization, industrial processes, um, from uh, you know particles from abrasion, from tires on roads, any any type of uh, sources of, of of particles, dust, aerosols, uh, sulfur dioxide, etc., in the atmosphere. So there's direct effects, as I mentioned in my previous video, where they block some of the sunlight reaching the Earth, causing this global dimming or reduction of surface solar radiation, but there's also many powerful indirect effects where they act as cloud condensation nuclei for clouds, making clouds brighter, and they also can increase the lifetime of clouds in these other effects. So um, how powerful are these effects? So I'm going to talk about why climate cooled in the mid-20th century to explain some of these factors. Um, with aerosol particles. I'm just going to get the lights to uh, improve my contrast. So why did the climate cool in the mid 20th century? So um, this skeptical science article um, is very good, uh, talks about the basics here. So basically, if this is the temperature graph, um, this is showing from 1880 to about uh, 2010 or so. It shows a rapid increase in temperature from the late 70s. Um, and the base, this is the anomaly. So this is about the zero line. So that's an increase of about 0 0.6 degrees. Um, and uh, you know that was up to say five years ago or you know up to 2010, 2011 or so. Keep that in mind, but the 0.6 degree increase over here, we actually had a decrease from the 40s, wartime, World War II time, to the, uh, to the basically uh, 70s, you know, early, uh, not as far as, not reaching the 80s, a drop, a decline. So um, why did this happen? Okay, so we think that the primary cause of this cooling was an increase in atmospheric aerosols due to anthropogenic emissions, so mostly from the burning of fossil fuels. Aerosols have a complex effect on the climate because of the direct and indirect impacts. So the direct impact is that the um, the direct impact is that these aerosols um, they scatter and they absorb shortwave and longwave radiation, um, and that's also known as global dimming. So they alter the radiation balance of, in, on the planet. Um, so the key parameters are the aerosol optical depth, the properties and distribution of these aerosols in the article as to how much light they block. So this is a direct effect. Now there is this very powerful indirect effect here. And the indirect, so this is a direct effect. The aerosols just scatter some of the light and um, they generally, there's less light reaching the surface and that generally causes cooling on the surface. However, if these aerosol particles have a large proportion of black carbon in them, then rather than reflect the light, they'll absorb that light. So they'll cause a massive heating of the atmosphere, which contributes to global warming. That heat, they're not heating the surface, they're heating the atmosphere. So, the, so this complicates things. This is an unperturbed cloud, big water droplets, it's raining out. With uh, more aerosols, in the atmosphere, if they're small then enough, which they are, then they create smaller water droplets. So this is a cloud that is less likely to rain. So this is the first order, or the first indirect effect. It's called the Tuomi effect. It's a cloud albedo effect. The cloud, smaller particles in the cloud, water goes on the smaller particles, it's more highly reflective, it reflects more sunlight, cools the surface. This type of effect has been, um, attributed to enhancing or increasing the Sahel droughts, for example, or droughts in the Sahara, making things drier, less rainfall. The other thing is that these clouds can travel along further distances, 
So the lifetime of the cloud is longer. It's less likely to precipitate out. It's more likely to travel. So this is a secondary, uh, the cloud lifetime effect. It's the second indirect effect. Um, and the other thing that can happen is these cloud, the geometry of the clouds can be different. The clouds um, can be lighter. The clouds can be at a higher altitude, a higher cloud height, changing the effects. Generally, low clouds tend to shade the earth, cause cooling at the surface. Higher clouds uh, tend to be more, let more light through, and then they tend to trap heat and cause a warming effect. Um, so the lifetime of the clouds increasing is a factor. Also, you know, so you can have the higher clouds here. There's indirect, indirect effects on the ice clouds and contrails. And also, if there's more heating on the planet, then there's more cloud burn-off. So the cloud lifetime will decrease. Also, when the clouds are created from water vapor in the air, if they cause shading and cooling of the surface, then there'll be less evaporation and less cloud formation. So there's all of these different complex interactions um, to see the net effect of the aerosols. So if we look at the intergovernmental panel on claim uh, on climate, intergovernmental panel on climate change, radiative forcing diagram, you can see CO2, the largest effect, of course, methane here, halo carbons, nitrous oxide, um, some of the CO, um, volatile organics, NOxs, okay? But this is the aerosol variation. I'll read the number. The mean is minus 0 0.27 watts per square meter. This is the radiative forcing relative to 1750. Okay, so it's a negative, so it causes cooling, but the range is minus 0 0.77 to plus 0 0.23. This is a lot of global dimming. This would be a lot of global brightening here. Now, notice that the net forcing uh, from 1980, it's about 1.25 watts per square meter, 2.25 watts per square meter, 2011. Okay, the difference is about one watts per square meter, and that resulted in that 0 0.6 degrees Celsius of warming, which I showed you up here, right? From here to here, about 0 0.6. Okay, so one watt per square meter of radiative forcing caused that amount. So minus 0.77 would be three quarters of, a, of that uh, 0 0.6 degree drop, which is, um, which is about 0 0.4, uh, three quarters times 0 0.6, 18 over four. It's about four and a half, um, 0.45 um, degrees Celsius cooling. Um, if it was, if, if that was the number minus point zero point seven seven, so that would be, so if we got rid of the global dimming um, effect, suddenly shut off all the global dimming, that would raise the temperature, you know, if this is the correct number it's within these error bars, that would raise the temperature about 0.545 degrees, so under half a degree. If it was this number here, um, if it was the, the plus 0 0.23 number, that would be, so a quarter of 0.6, that's 0 0.015. So that would mean getting rid of the aerosols, we would actually get a cooling of 0 0.15 degrees Celsius, okay, if it was at that end. So there's a wide variation, but there's nothing approaching that four uh, degree Celsius, you know, instant rise in temperature getting rid of aerosols due to global dimming. And that's a completely absurd, uh, non-scientific basis uh, number, unless somebody can send me you know, some studies and stuff showing otherwise, we're talking about a maximum number of about 0.45 or 0.5 degrees Celsius, you know, rise in temperature almost overnight, say, if you got rid of the um, aerosols from global dimming. Okay, so that's what the data is showing here. Um, so let's look at some other factors here. Um, so it, you know, the aerosols are actually contributing, the aerosol change, you know, increasing aerosols causing a temperature stalling or decline, decreasing aer aerosols contributing to the temperature rise. Uh, this type of trend um, we're seeing is, you know, you can't say that rise of temperature is completely just from global warming. That rise of temperature seems to be from a reduction of aerosols 
um, since the uh, 1980s. So let's have a look at this particular chart here. This shows the aerosol, aeros atmospheric sulfate aerosol concentration in parts per billion uh, from ice cores and from um, anthropogenic sulfate emissions. So we measure the emissions and we get the red line. We measure what's in the ice cores. We get the black line. Good agreement on that. Um, and uh, what we see is that because of the Clean Air Acts and Pollution Acts and things, we got a decline in, in uh, the uh, sulfates. So if we go, uh, so we got a decline in the sulfates and that decline in the sulfate cleaned up the air, reduced air pollution deaths, etc. Um, but it did mean that there was less global dimming, there was global brightening, and the air temperature as a result, the surface air temperatures have been rising rapidly since about this time when the sulfates were cut down. We know that sulfate, you know, we can actually calculate the direct aerosol forcing. Okay, it, this is the um, solar constant, so this is the top of the atmosphere solar irradiate, ir ir irradiance from the sun. Um, we have the, how much gets transmitted through the atmosphere is the T value. AC is, this is the area, fractional coverage by cloud, so 1 minus AC is open air where the radiation can, can um, the flux comes down. Um, the reflectivity of the clouds here um, squared because it's over an area. Uh, we have beta as a fraction of upward scattered flux, and this is the optical thickness, delta. Okay, so using these numbers, you can calculate the direct effect. Um, you can also calculate the sulfate aerosol cooling effect, and the numbers that they calculated, okay, just from these, sim this from these not too complex, I was going to say simple calculation, would show that you get an approximately 0 0.1 degree C cooling of global average surface temperatures from 40 to 75. This is from the calculations, and this is sort of the number of what we see. So we're in the right ballpark of these calculations. It seems clear that this, a lot of, that this, that the, one, the main cause of this drop, you know, we can say the main cause of this drop seems to be the increase of aerosols from World War II to um, the, to uh, just pre-1980, okay? Another factor is um, the aerosols, uh, you know, another factor that seems to corroborate this is the daily temperature range or the diurnal temperature range. When you have um, aerosols, when you have more aerosols, it shields some of the light reaching the surface, reducing the daily surface high temperature. And because you have the aerosols at night, blocking in some of the heat, it means it doesn't get as cold on the surface at night. So it raises both the um, daily minimum temperature, it raises that temperature, and it lowers the daily maximum temperature, so it decreases the, the, uh, the um, diurnal temperature range when the aerosols are there. We saw the opposite effect after 9-11. Planes weren't flying for three days, the contrails weren't, being, weren't up there, and we saw the the diurnal temperature range increased about a degree Celsius. So it got warmer, um, it got colder at night because more heat could be escaping. Um, there were less uh, aerosols, less contrails, and it got warmer during the day because the, the surface, the solar radiation at the surface was, was increased. Okay, so, um, so the main shift um, according to this, is, is, is the global surface temperatures was the Clean Air Act, say 1970, amendments in 77 and 90, and so on. Um, and this is global anthropogenic sulfur emissions. And again, you know, very rapid rise here. Uh, so 1940 uh, up to about 1980 or so, very rapid rise in sulf sulfur emissions around the planet in the troposphere, lower atmosphere and uh, then leveling off, and then after it leveled off, that's when we see, see the large rise in, in temperature. So the aerosols, so the mid-century cooling was primarily anthropogenic in summary, um, and the, the, the global surface temperature was, um, was decreased, um, and uh, so the aerosols reduced the global surface temperature